Press and, and thank you again to our esteemed group of panelists who have uh, agreed to participate on a, on, a, on a very timely subject. And of course, thank you to the ASIL International Criminal Law Interest Group for hosting this important panel discussion, which feels as if it becomes more important every day as we see the impacts of climate change around the world. Um, just yesterday, Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights commented before the 48th session of the, High, uh, of the Human Rights Council that, and I, and I quote, as environmental threats intensify, they will constitute the biggest challenge to human rights in our era, end quote. To which she then concluded, the greatest uncertainty is what policymakers will do about them. Today's panel is intended to address that very question within the context of international criminal law. In late 2020, the Stop Ecocide Foundation convened an independent expert panel for the purposes of proposing a legal definition of a new international crime of ecocide. Now that the concept of ecocide is nothing new and has been debated by academics, climate activists, and legal professionals for more than half a century. However, it's only in the most recent years that the idea has become increasingly widespread with Pope Francis, climate activist Greta Thunberg and French President Emmanuel Macron all endorsing the movement to recognize ecocide as an international crime. In June 2021, a group of 12 lawyers from around the world with a balance of backgrounds and expertise in criminal, environmental law and climate law, including two of our esteemed panelists today, finalized a proposal for the new crime seeking to pave the way for acts of environmental destruction to be incorporated within the mandate of the International Criminal Court. Now, I won't recite the definition that has been proposed. For those who are watching, you can find that at ecocidelaw.com, and I'm sure it'll come up in the context of our conversation. But needless to say, that proposal has in turn captured the attention of policymakers, journalists, and academics around the world. Some have critiqued it for not going too far. Some have levied legal critiques for, it going too, for not going far enough, and others have wondered how an overburdened ICC can take on a, seeming, uh, a new crime with a seemingly full docket. So with all of that said, our esteemed uh, group of, uh, of advocates and lawyers and, 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 and academics are going to discuss these and other issues pertaining to the proposed definition of ecocide. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce them now. And I'll go through um, how I see you on my screen, although that might be different for other, obviously for others who are watching this. And I'll begin with Kate McIntosh, who is the executive director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA School of Law and deputy co-chair of the Ecocide Drafting Committee, excuse me, panel. She also chairs a working group on environmental criminal law and the protection of the environment at the Promise Institute. Prior to joining UCLA, Ms. McIntosh was the deputy registrar for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Thank you, Kate, and welcome. Next, I go to Charles Jalo. Professor Jalo is a professor at the Florida International University and founding editor of the African Journal of Legal Studies and the African Journal of International Criminal Justice. Professor Jalo is a member of the UN International Law Commission, was a member of the panel of experts on the election of the prosecutor of the ICC, which he chaired, and relevant for today's discussion, he was also a member of the Ecocide Drafting Panel. I next go to Yelena Aparak. Yelena is the chairperson rapporteur for the UN Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries. Dr. Aparak is a lecturer in international humanitarian law, human rights law, international criminal law, and international refugee law. She has worked in conflict areas, including South Sudan, Chad and Darfur, the DRC, and the Central African Republic, and is a well-known publicist on international criminal liability for corporations for international crimes committed in non-international armed conflicts. And finally, but certainly not least, is Professor Kai Ambos. Professor Ambos is a chair for criminal law, criminal procedure, comparative law, international criminal and international law at the George August Universität in Groningen in Germany, as well as the director of the Study Center for Latin American Criminal and Criminal Procedural Law at the same university. He is also a judge at the Kosovo Specialist Tribunal, excuse me, Chambers, and an advisor at the 
Colombian uh, special jurisdiction for peace in Bogota. I have cut a lot of your accolades out. I apologize and, and kept it to, I think, the most salient points of your backgrounds for purposes of discussion. But we are very, very proud to have such an esteemed group of individuals to discuss this topic. Now, with all of that said, uh, let me kick this off immediately uh, with some general threshold questions, which I think are important to put things in context here. And, and Kate and Charles, I'll direct this principal question to you first, which is why do we even need a new crime of ecocide? Now, I, I say this because we know that international criminal law is enormously slow to evolve. Um, the, the crime of aggression took over tw 20 years to be incorporated into the Rome Statute, despite it being a Nuremberg crime, being, uh, uh, having a General Assembly definition in 1974, and being a crime hotly debated at the Rome Conference. So why do we need a new crime knowing the political capital that'll be required rather than focus on leveraging existing laws? And I hand it over to you to answer. Shall I start, Charles? Okay. Um, first of all, thanks so much for the invitation, Nima, and uh, it's really great to be here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation on my favourite topic. Um, so why do we need a new car? I don't think any of us are starry-eyed about the prospects for success here. It's clearly going to be an uphill struggle. At the same time, I think, as you indicated in your introduction, we feel that there is a moment, there is a moment now, and that that moment is only going to intensify as we see the increasing impacts of climate change. So as you all know, it would be possible to address certain kinds of climate or environmental damage more broadly within the framework of the current statute and the current crimes, um, as long as the other constituent elements of the crimes were fulfilled. So of course it could be possible to commit some kind of genocide or attempt to through destroying the environment. Similarly, it could be possible to mount a widespread and systematic attack on a civilian population as required by crimes against, crimes against humanity, which involving massive environmental damage. And the war crime of causing widespread long-term and severe damage to the environment obviously does already exist. But it was clear to us that um, these definitions leave out a huge amount of environmental damage and actually potentially that that is most uh, pressing and important for us to address so even with the best will in the world and mobilizing the existing statute that would not give us the kind of tool that we envision the crime of ecocide to be and that is something which would really send a message about damaging the environment per se, its interrelationship to human life and dignity and how it needs to be criminalized on an international level. Uh, thank you, Kate. Charles, I don't know if you had further thoughts on that. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nima. And of course, thanks to the American Society International Criminal Law Interest Group uh, for convening uh, this discussion. And I very much appreciate uh, the uh, possibility of getting into this discussion uh, this afternoon. Um, my initial thoughts are really essentially threefold. Uh, firstly, uh, when you think about a justification for this crime, I think it's very clear when you look at what's happening with the implementation of the Rome Statute, that there is in fact a connection between the commission of environmental crimes uh, with the uh, the environmental destruction that we see. In fact, as you know, uh, colleagues in the audience would know, the ICC Office of the uh, uh, Prosecutor has taken a view uh, that they do see sufficient connections, that they need to include elements of environmental concern when you determine case selection within situations. Uh, this is a direct line that's been drawn by the Office of the Prosecutor based on the experience with the implementation of the Rome Statute. So my first response would be essentially a pragmatic one about the effectiveness of the ICC system in so far as we see connections between the Rome Statute crimes and the destruction of the environment. So that's the first point. Uh, second point is perhaps a bit more uh, theoretical, and that really relates to a system of criminal law at the international level. Of course, we have a variety of theories out there that justify or attempt to justify international criminal law. But one of the central arguments that we've seen over the past 20 to 30 years 
is that we achieve some kind of deterrent effects, uh, both whether deterrent a specific level or a more general level. Now that's a bit harder to show empirically. We know the debates about deterrence and whether deterrence in fact does work even at the domestic level where we've had more experience with the prosecution of crimes, even more so a challenge at the international level. Uh, having said that, I see it as a fairly symbolic. Uh, if you think of international criminal law uh, justifications, it's a system that's symbolic in terms of expressing the values of the international community. I think what we see with the Rome Statute crimes is that we are, performing some kind of, at least states are, performing some kind of expressive function. So I think if you think of the where the world is today, you started off, Nima, with the quote from the uh, uh, Michel Bachelet, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, it really shows the challenge that we face in our time. I'm not saying that the criminal law tool would be <laughs> the only tool. It's one of a wider panoply of measures that we need to look at at the international level in terms of dealing with the threats uh, essentially to the environment and to humanity and all the living species on earth as a whole. I'll just end with the final point, which is perhaps zooming out a little bit more to think about what we have in terms of legal frameworks. Um, at the international law level, we have a whole body of international environmental law, which essentially is a state-centered system that gives a lot of flexibility to states in terms of protecting their environment. So we design at a broad level a system and say to the states, go out there and try to implement this obligation. So they focus centrally, um, effectively on, on, on interstate systems. Now individuals, of course, become part of this conversation. And we don't have, a, a because of the nature of international law, we don't have a system to give enforcement to a lot of the general prohibitions we have in international environmental law. I think international law could be part of the wider solution. And I think the possibility of a crime at the international level that plays that expressive function that complements the existing system and supplements what we have in relation to the Rome started crimes could well be uh, an added value for the international community that pushes us a little bit closer to where we want to go, which is to say that we want to protect the earth for everybody and all the living species on the planet. I'll stop there for now and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. And that was that was very enlightening by, from both of you. I just a quick follow up question because Professor Jalo, I think you touched upon a point that that Kate was mentioning. One was the fact that the the, the prosecution, at least it seems since his 2016 uh, policy paper on case strategy, uh, would factor in environmental crimes. Now, 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 Kate, you mentioned that at least it, 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 what I what I understood from you mentioning is that that current structures of international criminal law don't seem robust enough to really address um, the penelope of environmental harms that we might think need to rise the level of an international crime. I'm, I'm curious um, where the committee thought there might be a gap between the environmental harms that exist, that the committee felt should rise to an environmental crime, or sorry, into an international crime, and where there are limits within the current structures of international criminal law through the crimes that you already, already identified. Well, if we look at crimes against humanity, which is perhaps the most obvious <clears throat> place uh, to, to address environmental harm other than the specific war crime. Uh, so in outside the context of armed conflict, um, as listeners will know, a prosecutor would have to establish a widespread and systematic attack on a civilian population. And I think this notion of attack is problematic. Um, in terms of encompassing the broad range of environmental damage that we that we would want to see prohibited with a crime of ecocide. So now it may be possible to look at certain kinds of action as constituting an attack as defined by the jurisprudence of the ICC. But what about the big question, climate change? So I think all of us feel that we have to have a definition which could be developed to encompass some of the most serious acts responsible for climate change. And there's a whole other conversation in there, of course, about how those acts are determined and who bears responsibility and so on. But I think it would be a huge challenge to look at some of those major contributing factors, whether that's around fossil fuel extraction or combustion or other kinds of um, you know, massive addition um, of carbon to the environment to characterize any of those industrial systematic certainly acts as an attack on the civilian population. So that's a, you know, an immediate threshold problem with crimes against humanity. Um, with war crimes, of course, there is an existing crime. It only applies in international armed conflict. 
we could think about amending the statute to mirror that particular crime in non-international armed conflict, um, but it, uh, it's never going to help us in peacetime. And what we're looking at now and our climate crisis is not the problem of environmental damage caused uh, during conflict, at least certainly not principally. Now, pro pro Professor Oak, Charles, I, I think you're off mute and you wanted to add something to that. If I may, uh, very briefly, just to make the point, I think Kate has done a fantastic job uh, setting out some of the considerations that we had in relation to the specific project that we were tasked with. But if you zoom out a little bit, the entirety of the Rome statute system is basically centered around the four so-called core crimes, right? We have, of course, the crime of aggression, which is sufficiently distinct, we could set it aside for a moment, and then deal with the other three crimes, uh, war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And so Kate spoke about uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, when you look at genocide, when you look at war crimes, uh, then you can get into the debates as to whether you can shoehorn those crimes to address environmental concerns. The difficulty, the entirety of the system is anthropocentric. We're concerned about damage to human beings. That's the essence of the whole Nuremberg paradigm. What we are dealing with here when it comes to environmental destruction is the possibility that there are connections to environmental destruction and harm to human beings, but that extend beyond that to the environment, the natural environment as such. So you cannot, in our view, at least in terms of the discussions we had in the panel, uh, really rely on genocide as a way out to deal with this pressing issue for the international community. That brings it then to war crimes, where we have, as Kate pointed out, Article 8, and essentially really leaves us with one option um, in terms of intentionally launching an attack um, where you have incidental loss of life or injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects, and then you have that, that alternative or widespread long-term and severe damage to the environment. That is one of the most established notions. And in the entirety of the Rome status system, this is the best way out when you're dealing with this particular, or if you are interested in dealing with this particular problem and believe that the ICC system could be part of that solution. So the point that I'm trying to make as a takeaway is essentially that we have a system that is not geared to thinking about the environmental damage, it's focused really on harm to humans, which of course is important. And of course really relates also to why we want to protect the environment. If you look at the policy paper from 2016, uh, but then you need to address essentially what is happening to the world. And potentially our, our feeling was we could work with that existing uh, crime and then see uh, what the possibilities may be to present to states, or at least present an open -air discussion on this important issue. So just to say in the end, uh, in conclusion, that I think it was a first effort, uh, but we thought that it was worthy. Of course, the Stop Ecoside Foundation being the ones behind it, it was a worthy effort uh, to undertake. Thank you both. I think those are obviously important points. Uh, Kai and Yellen, I, I kind of want to come to you now. Um, beginning with, with Professor Ambos, I know you indicated, for instance, in your June 29th article on Israel Talk, um, you wrote, it's, it is doubtful whether a new standalone crime, core crime, is, is needed to better protect the environment, which seems to countenance some of the comments that we've heard. And I'm, I'm curious whether you can elaborate on that and maybe address some of the points that, uh, that Kate and Professor Jallo just mentioned. Okay, yes. Uh, thanks a lot for organizing this. and. Thanks to the panelists and to this panel in, in particular to have drafted this, uh, this definition. I think, uh, let me first stress that I know from my experience, it's not easy to draft uh, such kind of proposals. And they are certainly, uh, they certainly have the credit that we now have this discussion. And um, so I think that um, I would welcome and I welcome this initiative. Um, of course, we are all, including all the critics, in favor of protecting our environment. I'm sitting, by the way, Neymar, not in Groningen, but in Göttingen, and I'm now in the south, in the Black Forest, German Black Forest, and we know what environment is about. I mean, I was a member of the Green Party 25 years ago, and so there is a strong movement pro-environment. And so that should be outside the discussion. Um, but let me may, maybe take out four points uh, following up on Kate's and Charles' um, uh, interventions. First, um, uh, 
what I what I the point I made in my little blog um, was this issue of what can criminal law actually do in our world. I mean, I'm a criminal lawyer. No, I'm a criminal law practitioner and a criminal law professor. I worked for 40 years in criminal law, and I'm not at all convinced that criminal law can solve social, economic, and other problems. And I think this is an argument which still has to be made. And I think it's not sufficient to write a proposal with five pages reasoning without addressing this issue. And the point that you have kind of um, deterrent effect or you have even a positive effect in terms of expressivism needs to be demonstrated. I mean, we have what we could do, for example, we could have empirical studies on national environmental criminal law. We have it in all, all over the place. We have in the French penal code, in the German penal code, in national codes, many, many environmental crimes. And then we should look at the impact of these crimes in terms of reducing environmental damage. That would be, for example, a proposal in trying to close this empirical gap. As to the second, the second point, this policy paper. Actually, this is a counter argument, Charles, if I may so say, because the policy paper rested on the existing framework. So actually what, what the OTP said is there are, of course, environmental ingredients of crimes in armed conflict in peacetime. We see it all over the place. And the question then was, can we use the existing framework to um, prosecute these crimes? Um, you know that uh, 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 Moreno Campo made his point early, early with the blood, blood diamonds, which also has an environmental side to it. And of course, we have gaps in the ICC system. It's absolutely clear. I mean, that's beyond the discussion. Nobody would criticize it. The, the proposal is saying that uh, an international armed conflict crime like Article 8 um, uh, uh, is, 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 is falling short of the demands. That's obvious. That's, that's not the point. The genocide doesn't do the trick either. And crimes against the media, of course, not directly referring to environmental crime. But the question is, if the answer to this is, a new crime within the system of the ICC and not, and that would be my third point, think of other solutions. I mean, in the whole treaty crimes area, drug trafficking, money laundering, organized crime, we are working with states implementation, cooperation on states. And of course, we could improve the environmental criminal law at the international level. We can have conventions which just close this gap so we could have a much more efficient treaty-based regime for environmental protection. As, by the way, we try to do with the Crimes Against Humanity Convention, as you know, a separate convention um, uh, apart from Article 7. So this is another thing to think about. Um, and the other, maybe my fourth point, and that's um, the issue of individual versus collective responsibility. The, the main um, um, uh, uh, perpetrators in envi en environmental crimes are basically multinational corporations. I mean, corporations in our countries, Germany, France, United States, Canada, and so on. And of course, we have no collective respons responsibility under the ICC system, as you all know. So if you, now if I just looked at you, uh, the new website, you already want to bring it to the Assembly of State Parties. Now, you, then you have to change the whole regime. It's not just bringing a crime into the state with individual responsibility, you will never get hold of the corporate actors where we have other process, exactly in the Human Rights Council, in the working group, trying to make a convention on the responsibility of corporate actors for serious human rights violations. And that includes environmental damage. So um, in the end, just talking about the policy level, and, and maybe we will not have time to go on the nitty gritty details of the proposal. And, and he was a bit disappointed, I mean, seeing that there are experts like Charles and Kate in this group. I think there are many, many mistakes in the proposal. That's a technical level. That's the second level. Maybe we don't discuss this now, but you could have done a better proposal. I mean, if you are, if you are convinced that we need a in, in new crime, Article 8, tear of the statute, and I'm not convinced by that. Uh, within the ICC system, then I think you could have taken a bit of more profound approach to some nitty gritty doctrinal issues in your proposal. And I just refer to my critic, to Kevin Hellers, to Carvin Canavas. So I think this needs to be improved. I mean, if you want to go this road, please send it around. I mean, that was Michael's proposal in his 15 pages Opinion Juris blog. 
send it around to to other people and and let's let's improve it i mean if you are really interested in a in a consolidated proposal this will not go through it is absolutely clear i mean you will not get two thirds and so you may better rethink it and 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 send it around and try to improve but anyway thanks a lot for your work on this and for all your efforts and for the american society for making this making this interesting conversation so I do want to pick up on a couple of those threads, and we'll get into the, the nitty gritty, I think, of the, the actual proposal in a minute. Uh, the first of those threads I want to pick up, and Yelena, I know you've looked into this quite in depth, is really Professor Ambos's point of why do we even need something in international criminal law that's specific to this? Like, what, what is it fundamentally about ICL that's going to add value to this? Why not just focus our efforts with regards to human rights protections or uh, efforts on the domestic level or, or maybe efforts elsewhere? And I know, Yelena, you've, you've looked at that. I'm curious what you have to say about that. And then obviously, Kate and Charles, I'd, I'd love if you could respond to some of the critiques that, that, that Professor Ambos had just mentioned. But let's begin with Yelena. Thank you, Nima. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And thank you for the American Society of International Law for organizing this. And I apologize in advance because I'm sick, as it usually happens on a day when you're excited to do something as, as interesting as this panel. Yes, I think uh, the, it, the international criminal law is extremely useful uh, point, but one should not exclude another. I think we are at the stage, and Kate mentioned it super well, I, uh, this is a very timely moment for for talking about this, discussing, uh, building on the proposal. The proposal is a starting point and of course it's going to be built on, but we need all the efforts and all the, the instruments and the experts and all the avenues and forums that we can get. We cannot exclude one for the benefit of the other. That's very clear. On a domestic level, but the, the main issue is, and, and I'm, I'm, I think Kai mentioned it, is what exactly is the purpose of the ecocide? What are we trying to achieve? And why are we trying to achieve it? I think Charles responded as well. It, it should reflect some of the values of international community. So in a domestic level, it's very important that we continue the, the trials. I think we should not stop on that level. And the environmental proceedings and, and moving towards the climate change proceedings is extremely significant and it's evolving and it's, it's evolving in a very satisfying way. So this should not stop, even if the process before the International Criminal Court continues. And in fact, domestic proceedings uh, on the uh, issue of environmental crimes were what I would call the first generation of the doctrine of the modern doctrine of corporate liability. And I can come back to that later, <clears throat> if I'll st still have my voice. I'd just like to mention the issue of the International uh, Court for Environment proposal that, that, that you mentioned, the, the, the coalition on the, uh, that proposed the, the court. I think we also need to be realistic. Yes, we do need to use all the avenues that we can, but we need to use the existing ones. We are clearly in the, in the, in the moment where there is the multilateral crisis. Uh, states are very um, careful about what they vote for, what they adopt. Uh, and of course, they're very careful about what they put the money on and the budget. So uh, the ICC is already there. So one thing that makes it very an interesting avenue, the coalition for the court for environmental crimes um, is interesting, but they have two aspects that I would like to just address. One is that they, their added value for the court that they believe is that the, the court would have actually have the specialized judiciary. And I think that's a very fair point, but that specialized judiciary can equally be attached to the, let's say, International Criminal Court. The other thing that I'm very worried about this particular um, court proposal of the International Court for the Environment is who could introduce the claims against who. And the, the, the proposal, the current proposal as it is on the website is that the state and non-state actors can introduce claims against states. And here, I, I kind of fear that we're gonna end up in the investor state dispute settlement regime where the state and who would be the non-state actor, corporations again, who would introduce claims against uh, other states, whereas the states could not introduce claims against corporations, and Kai mentioned it, I totally agree, corporations are the ones we want to go after that, but I can uh, come to back to that later. And finally, the International Criminal Court, uh, why, why, why would it actually, uh, what would be the added value? And I think that all three speakers before me mentioned it, and there is a common agreement to this, I think. 
there and, and, and also, as, as you mentioned, uh, Madam Bachelor announced yesterday at the beginning of the Human Rights Council, and it's extremely significant that she opened the session, the September session, uh, with this statement relating to the environment as we, uh, from the special procedures, address environment through different lenses of our mandates. Uh, there are increasing reports on the link between uh, the environment and human rights and how this affects human rights. And there, there is in fact a global challenge and there are common concerns to the humankind. So it does reflect the, the Rome statue in that sense that it, it addresses the grave crimes for humanity today and affects peace and security. I'm gonna stop here for the moment, but uh, thank you. Jelena, thank you for that. And I, I hope you feel better. Charles and Kate, I'd love if you could respond to some of the some of the points that Kai just mentioned. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nima. So, Kate, if it's okay, I'll take it uh, first this time. Excellent. Okay. So, of course, thank you to uh, Kai and Elena for their thoughtful uh, interventions. Uh, Kai has raised about four points. I'm not going to respond to all of the four points. I'll just uh, share some, some reflections on some of the points. Uh, the one macro point. The one macro point that is a theme at this point, both from Kai's comments and Elena's comment, uh, concerned whether we need to have an environmental crime and whether the ICC would be the appropriate place to do so. If we decide that there's a need, if states decide there's a need for an international environmental crime, I think it's very clear that there is some momentum towards this. But Nima, you opened the session pointing out that this discussion has been around for a long time. It seems as if the timing may be right. On the other hand, I take very seriously and myself raise the issue of timing, given the challenges that the ICC itself is facing as an institution in respect to the specific Rome statute crimes that took us almost 50 years at the international level. The idea of a permanent international criminal court was discussed in the context of the genocide convention negotiations in the ad hoc committee of the sixth committee of the general assembly that was in 1947 it didn't come to fruition until 1998 and now we know where the court is 20 plus years in that is facing a lot of challenges so yes there's a very fair legitimate concern whether we can expect the icc to if you will be burdened with an additional crime of a different nature but in my view, that would be a question for states to decide, right? As academics and scholars and activists and, and you know, individuals, human beings without any you know, affiliations of any kind, uh, ordinary, if you were global citizens, we can raise the discussion, have the discussion. And given where the world is, it may be the case that states might say, okay, this could be the time to, to think about that. But again, that would be a matter for states uh, to take on board. A uh, second point, a very, very interesting uh, counterpoint uh, by Kai that, well, in fact, the prosecutor is saying in our 2016 policy paper on prosecutorial strategy that I'll use the existing crimes. Of course, that's the only thing the prosecutor can say, right? The prosecutor is not going to be able to say, well, I'll come up with new crimes on the international and present them to you. The closest one could argue that has happened in Rome's statute system and we've seen in other courses where you have an argument of a customary international law crime. And in the Rome statute context, we see this crime against humanity or forced marriage been used, right? But we know the origins of that in the context of the Special Court for Sierra Leone jurisprudence and the feedback loop in terms of developing that crime. So in other words, my, 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 my pushback a little bit is to say, yeah, that's the only thing the prosecutor can say, is not to exclude the possibility that a more specific crime dealing with that question may not be appropriate. Third point, it's very interesting you raise the issue of crimes against humanity. Uh, I've been part of a privilege to be part of discussions on this issue at the international level, especially the ILC, where we had a lot of debates about crimes against humanity. We still have a gap in international law concerning crimes against humanity. But one thing that was very evident in the ILC discussions of these draft articles is that there is now ever more so a clearly a connection between transnational crimes and crimes against humanity. In fact, if you see the underlying basis for, the, for a lot of the instrument, including the elements of cooperation and mutual legal assistance, the commission drew heavily from the transnational organized crimes convention. So the UN conventions in that area, I mean, we looked at a whole range of instruments uh, to effectively try to find, if you will, and bridge the gap between transnational criminal law regimes that are more robust in relevance of cooperation and mutual legal assistance between states. So if we will then bring them home to some extent to crimes against humanity, which has been missing that component. 
And then I'll just end with the final uh, note about individual versus collective responsibility and how that links to empirical work. Well, of course, the main purveyors of environmental crimes arguably could be said to be corporations. But I think that the challenge we face doesn't end with saying, well, there's a human rights system out there dealing with these questions. I think the, the whole regime of ICL is centered at the moment on individual responsibility and colleagues are aware that at Rome, there was a proposal to include corporate liability. That didn't go anywhere. My feeling is one could be idealistic and now say, we must do that now, right now, and then go to states and see what happens. I'm very, very hesitant to make even the proposal because I doubt that it will make the kind of, it will find the political support to go further. And I'll just note that at the regional level, there's some interesting things happening. If you think about Africa in the sense of the Malabo Protocol, note that even though the Malabo Protocol provides for corporate criminal responsibility, there has not been a single ratification of the Malabar Protocol. I'm not going to attribute it to the corporate liability aspects because in fact, this might be the environment where that idea will gain more steam. I'm just saying, notice that the instrument hasn't gone to one ratification and you need 15 to enter into force. I'll stop there and I'm sure Kate has more points to make in response to the conversation. Thank you so much. Oh, more and more points. It's getting more and more interesting. But um, no, first of all, you know, Thank you, Kai, for your enthusiastic support of the proposal. Um, look forward to discussing the nitty gritty with you. I hope we'll get on to that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, well, the point about deterrence, uh, it, it's a relevant point. I think we did discuss that. You know, it's obviously an assumption, this assumption that there will be some deterrent value and that assumption should be tested. However, I'm not convinced that that the fact that we haven't tested it is a reason not to proceed. And that's because of the symbolic value that everyone's referred to. So even if we are overestimating the deterrent effect, and we could talk actually about how the deterrent effect might operate within corporate decision-making structures in a quite different way to the way it may be operating in you know, governmental or non-state armed groups who might currently be subject to some of the other crimes in their own statutes in that one might think that a corporate decision-making body was more rational and might take a kind of risk of international individual criminal liability more seriously, might be more likely to change its behavior on the basis of that, but that's something we could talk about. Um, but in any event, um, without undermining at all your point that it would be a good idea to challenge that assumption, I do think that the symbolic value is reason enough to go ahead and I assume none of us would think it was a you know a good idea not to have the crime of genocide, whether or not we feel convinced that that's had a deterrent effect, for example. Um, on the flaws and limits of the ICC system, again, um, I think that uh, the panel certainly was well aware of that. And in our working group, um, which both Nima and Yelena are part of, you know, we've discussed that extensively. Um, so first of all, I would agree with the points made about focusing on the ICC does not it should not be to the exclusion of other efforts. I think it would be odd not to look at the ICC. It would be odd to aim for an international crime and not to address that within the context of the ICC statute. Um, Yelena's points about a whole new treaty, you know, and those obstacles are, are very valid. And of course, all the points that have been raised about getting something through in the ICC also. Actually, what I really think is that this is going to happen. I just think that there is going to be an international crime of damaging the environment. I just think that's where we're going. I think it, 10 years down the road, this is going to be an international crime. And we're currently discussing all the really important issues that we need to discuss in order to make it happen, you know, faster or slower. But I really think that it is almost inconceivable on the trajectory that we're on that even states are going to be able to accept a situation where destroying our common environment is not raised to an international level and is still left to the jurisdiction of individual states and to consensus-based unenforceable agreements like the Paris Agreement. I just think this is the trajectory we're on and it, it's just gonna happen sooner or later. I want to, um, I don't wanna end this part of the conversation uh, because I think it's an important one, but I do want to pivot briefly, because um, Kai, you alluded to these issues already, which is the the interpretive problems, whereby even if even if there was support in terms of filling in a gap which might be filled by having a new international crime, that the proposal itself 
might have particular problems associated with it. Um, I'm curious what you think are the principal interpretive problems. And then after you flag that, I'm actually curious what others think in terms of how those problems can be resolved, even through the def either through the, the definition that's been provided or through adjustments to the definition. But Kaya, I'll, I'll, if, if you can, I'm curious what you think those problems initially are. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, this kind of drafting exercise will never solve all issues. That's impossible. You know, the best drafter in the world, we had Jared Bersuni sitting on the drafting committee in Rome. And, uh, you know, the ICC statute has a lot of problems. We all know this. <laughs> so um, that, that's really not a kind of, I mean, not that Charles and Kate and all the other colleagues are to be blamed for this. I mean, there are things you cannot resolve and you have just to make the judge of their work. I mean, we always said in Rome, I was part of the term delegation, if we don't get an agreement, leave it to the judges. Maybe that, that was not a good idea, I think. In some case, we should have get better got an agreement. But anyway, um, uh, so, so that's my first point, just, just to, to put my critique in a context. And, you know, you write a blog for, for these kind of blogs and you have not much space and, 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 and you never do justice to the work of these people and, and Charles and all these people who, who spend their leisure time in, in, in drafting something which others then easily can you know, can, can, can uh, argumentatively destroy. So it's much easier to criticize than to draft in the first place. Let me make this point. Uh, as to the issues, I mean, uh, the one issue, I mean, I'm, I have the definition in front of me, the actual definition of the Article 8 tear, um, is the question of the balancing, you know. Um, and, you know, this point has been taken up by, by Kevin Heller first and, of course, then by Daryl Robinson in a very nuanced approach. And the issue is that, first of all, that by way of the definition of the term wanton, you bring in the balancing. That was, first of all, something which surprised many of us because wanton is, of course, a term which comes from IHL and it's, it's a term which has to do with the mental element and it's not really the term where you want to bring in the idea that we have to balance socio-economic benefits, um, uh, for example, done by environmental um, uh, uh, or, or linked to environmental damage. I mean, you know, we, we are actually now and uh, we are actually now doing something which has an environmental cost. I mean, we are having a Zoom conversation. So we are all part of this and we are all responsible. And of course, from a very reasonable perspective, from a corporate perspective, uh, you cannot, um, um, uh, you, you, you should not ignore that um, um, any industrial society uh, produces uh, collateral damage, if you want, in terms of the environment. And, and, and if, if we fly, we take airplanes, if we use our iPads, we actually should better shut up because we are part of this problem. And, and if you use iPhones, so that's the first thing. And and, and that's, a, that's a kind of environmental law. And that's totally logical that in I, an, I, environmental or administrative law, for example, or even in the international environmental law, uh, we have this balancing exercise included. And in international criminal law, um, I mean, Daryl, I think, is a bit too absolutist here. We have it too, I think. I mean, it's not that clear cut that we have in ICL always clear cut rules, absolute prohibitions and clear-cut criminalizations. Then we wouldn't have a problem with the principle of legality, and we have it all the time, Lex Theata and so on. So at any rate, we have to bring together this idea of the <clears throat> socioeconomic benefits and the criminalization of a conduct, you know, which is in, indeed uh, damaging to our environment, but on the, on the one hand has, has certain benefits. And how can we square this uh, circle? And one proposal which I think Daryl has made in his excellent piece, the second piece on opinion yours, Daryl Robinson, is this, you have, a, you have a clearer threshold. I mean, if you defined um, the, the actual damage and not maybe not just as a kind of endangerment conduct crime, but as a result crime saying that if a severe and long-term damage uh, has been caused, then there is no room for balancing. You know, that's the thing we have to think about. How can we get rid of balancing? I mean, in 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 a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a ecocide crime. I mean, using the word ecocide. I mean, it seems like you. I mean, it, it, and and balancing. It seems to be a contradiction. I mean, you say ecocide, not just environmental crime. You could you could you could use this word, but you use ecocide, and then you say, okay, but we allow for balancing. 
So that's really a problem, how to, to solve this problem of balancing. And then another problem is, of course, a whole mental element stuff in this, in this definition. And the mens rea, the fault element, however you call it, depending on your jurisdiction you come from. For example, I mean, I say in my piece, and I think that's true, and others have taken this up, that there is a contradiction in saying that I do not want to use Article 30, which is totally, uh, of course, legitimate. That's a default provision. You can say um, the standard is too high, too low, whatever you want, and then you use something else. But in, in fact, you actually use a higher standard, you know, because you say, you say uh, uh, someone has to commit with knowledge, committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood. So you say knowledge, positive knowledge. We call this dualist directors of the first degree. And the prosecutor has to prove this. And then you say substantial likelihood of long-term damage, not just likelihood. So actually, in the end, um, your uh, mental element, your mental standard is, in my interpretation, higher than Article 30. And it's certainly not dolos eventuales or recklessness, which anyway you put on equal footing. And, and that's a big debate. I mean, dolos eventuales, we have about 10 theories about dolos eventuales. You have English recklessness. From the House of Lords case law, you have the American recklessness. By the way, the model penal code never used the word wanton, just another idea. Wanton was never used by the American, uh, American Law Institute when they did the model penal code because I said it's a term you cannot use, it doesn't make sense. So these are, these are two issues um, in the definition uh, which I want to, to highlight, but of course, there could be more points uh, to, 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 be, to be made, uh, but I stop here. Yeah, I'm curious what the responses to these are. And we can, let's piece these apart for a second. One is, I think, the, uh, the, the commentary concerning the absence of any actual underlying acts and the existence of this balancing, which creates um, problems, in particular with the principle of legality. And the second, obviously, the high, heightened mens rea threshold that seems to deviate from Article 30. Um, taking the first, I don't know, Kate and Charles, whether you had any thoughts on that. And then we'll, we'll go to the second in a second. Yeah, thanks, Nima. I'd love to come in on the first. I think actually there might be two in there. One is the endangerment liability and the other one is the balancing, which um, are not necessarily linked. But I, um, I'd love to come in on the balancing thing. So thanks for bringing that up, Kai. So, um, I mean, we've thought about a lot of different ways of approaching this issue. I think, um, and Daryl has written about this, you know, in a very articulate way in his post. I think... Um, it was very significant to us. And on the panel, we had environmental lawyers and climate lawyers, as you know, but it was very significant for those, those of us who come from an international criminal law background like myself, to, to understand that really environmental, I mean, to, to, to understand our relationship with our environment through the prism of law and to realize, um, having come at the idea that we could prohibit environmental destruction, to realize that really environmental destruction is part of human existence on the planet and that environmental law understands this. And the goal of international environmental law, of course, is sustainable development. So it, we, we use the environment, which includes destroying it. I mean, from cutting down trees to you know, clearing vast areas and not necessarily for extractive industries, but perhaps just to you know, build a city or, or transport links. Uh, and we realized that um, any definition of severe harm, I mean, perhaps not any definition, but a definition of harm that would be appropriate for the kind of activities you wanted to capture through a crime of ecocide was problematic because that kind of destruction was also legitimate in certain circumstances and was actually part of how we all live and something that would be senseless to try and outlaw. Um, I mean, on a kind of theoretical level, but also on a pragmatic level. We had to accept and understand that the way we interact with the environment involves destruction, and that's not what we need to prohibit. What we need to prohibit is the unsustainable version of that. What we need to prohibit, and that's what we try and capture with the wanton idea, was senseless, unjustified, excessive damage, damage which is not part of that sustainable development equation. And we thought about whether we could include specific environmental law principles like sustainable development in the definition and played around with those kind of ideas. And in the end, the solution that we offered, and I'm very open, of course, to other solutions, but the solution that we felt was appropriate was to draw on the IHL model, 
of balancing and specifically to look at the existing crime of causing severe damage to the environment, which is in the statute, Article 82B4, which then in its um, it turn draws, of course, on additional protocol one, and is balanced in 82B4 against um, military advantage. And we thought that it would make sense to take that kind of framing for this balancing, which is at the heart of international environmental law and the way our relationship with the environment is structured through law, and to then craft this similar proportionality test but this time against the social and economic benefits anticipated. So the other part of the equation in international environmental law. So that's the thinking behind that. That is, I think, one way of approaching that issue. Uh, but I do, and I think there could be other ways. Um, I was quite happy with this one. I thought it was quite an elegant solution. Um, I'm certainly open to there being better ones, but I do think that a crime of just damaging the environment with no understanding of the kind of balancing that is done all the time within the structure of environmental law is, is, is not gonna fly. Uh, so uh, Charles, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, uh, Kai, I, I, I have a commentary on that, but I know you have some thoughts as well, but I'll first ask uh, Charles if he has anything he wants to add to that issue of balancing, because it does seem to create um, certainly it is obviously familiar with international environmental law and familiar in the context of human rights law, but it does seem to create a fundamental problem from, from, a, from a criminal law perspective, where the, the assumption is always to have clear lines so that people understand where their conduct is unlawful versus not. And obviously by having balancing uh, that, that clarity um, the, or the lack of clarity creates a fundamental problem from that standpoint. But but Charles, I don't know if you have additional thoughts on that. Thank you very much, uh, Nima. I would like to just make very brief comments because I think Kate has covered uh, very well um, the discussions that was had uh, were had in the context of the panel. Uh, but maybe a big, uh, broader point first uh, before specific comments uh, concerning the issue of wanting and the mens rea and some of the criticisms of that. I think the broad point is that we were quite aware that the, the choice of the panel would be to be ambitious and potentially have the perfect crime. That may, of course, we're in the context of a group that's trying to find consensus, that may find consensus. Uh, but then when it goes to states, it's very easy to just say, no, thank you very much. We don't want to do that. So the approach, if I remember correctly, and this is something that is alluded to in the panel's report, was to rely on existing prohibitions to the extent possible. So this is where the focus on Article 8 uh, became very promising for us. Now, when you link that to international environmental law with the whole balancing exercise that environmental law provides for at the national level, we were quite um, intent on finding the space where you could say, okay, because at the national level, uh, this is the way normally environmental law works. Uh, if you look at the different models, we had the ICRC study of national environmental laws. I think there are about 11 states, according to the ICRC, that had criminalized uh, some kind of ecocide or willful destruction of the environment, mostly from former Soviet republics um, in their national legislation. And the thrust there is the destruction of the flora or fauna. And again, that is very difficult to translate to the ICC context because the ICC context is really focusing on damage to human beings. So we're trying to, even in the definition that we come up with, find the balance between ambition and effectively political reality, right? In terms of what would happen. There have been different definitions as we all know, some of them more idealistic than others. And we've seen that that doesn't really take you too far. So the broad point is really to say that what you see in the definition reflects a choice. Of course, it is a choice and others may make that choice differently. Get to the specific point about wanting and this knowledge requirement and leaving out, if you will, the threshold that's in uh, Article 31 of the Rome Statute. I think Kate covered it very well. The only thing I would like to add there is that the Rome Statute prohibition, it, the provision is basically a default rule, as Kai pointed out, um, unless you find something else. So for us, at least the way I thought of it, when you have the balancing exercise going on, you need to find the space where you leave a little bit of room for interpretation. 
because ultimately we're not going to get political acceptability for a crime that says at the international level that just destroying the environment as such is enough. So building in the use in one thing, and I like the point about the model penal code. I mean, this, the model penal code has purpose, knowledge, uh, recklessness, and, 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 and that's really, really what it pushed in terms of giving some clarity to, to mental states. Um, so the influence of that, of course, on the ICC statute is very clear in terms of the mental uh, state requirements in Article 31. The takeaway for me was the balancing has to happen on multiple levels because you might find legal systems at the national level where environmental crimes could be strict liability, but it's very, very difficult to find that. In fact, a lot of the instances of uh, domestic action will relate to fines or administrative remedies or things of that nature, with things that will be more civil in nature as opposed to criminal. So this is really a delicate dance that the panel was dealing with. I personally have no, if you will, uh, dog in the fight in that sense. If there are better ways that folks feel that this definition could be improved, that's great. Let, the more the merrier, let's bring it up and have that discussion. Hopefully, that we, in a way that would benefit the states that would hopefully, if they get to it, uh, to take up the issue in the context of the ICC working group on amendments, where there's gonna be a whole different layer of complexity, I think, when you think about who will be in the room and who will not be in the room. I'll stop there, thank you very much. Kai, I'm curious to hear your points. I mean, one, one follow-up on what, what was just mentioned, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say on it, is balancing doesn't seem like it's completely prevented or prohibited under ICL. And I know Kate mentioned and made a reference to Article a 2 b 4 So I am kind of curious to see from your perspective whether or not one can, can have a circumstance or a provision which requires balancing while staying within the parameters of legality. And if so, where does it go afar such that actually it's too open, it's too broad, and thus the principality of legality comes into effect. You may have wanted to discuss that in any event, but I'm curious your thoughts on that, in addition to other thoughts you have on what Kate and Charles mentioned. Okay, um, just one uh, previous point. Magdi Guzman made an, made an interesting comment in the chat coming back to this OTP argument by Charles, actually supporting my argument before I made it. So just for you, Charles, to look at it later. Second point, um, as to the balancing, of course, you know, we have balancing in criminal law. We have it in IHL and in war crimes by way of proportionality, military necessity. That's all about balancing. That's, that's, uh, that's clear. And in criminal law, we have it by way of what you call as American or Anglo-Americans defenses, we call cause of justification in excuse. The necessity defense is a classical case, you know. I, I'm in a situation of a danger, someone is uh, imposing danger, not self-defense, but uh, necessity or duress, you know, where a demo which case in ICL, where of course there is a balancing. And, and we say there is this famous case where you say, well, you cannot kill another person and, and how strict is this rule? But this is balancing. So balancing is not strange to criminal law. And um, um, the, the, here is where I disagree with Daryl Robinson, actually, where I say Daryl is too absolutist to, you know, to, to make this as a kind of uh, things which are absolutely contradicting each other, environmental law and ICL. I mean, ICL has a lot of balancing elements, and therefore I would not exclude that you have balancing in, in uh, international crime. My issue was that you cannot call it ecocide. I mean, it, maybe that's because you have Philip Sands in the group, but <laughs> you did great work on the Nazis, and that's especially my great admiration for him. Um, uh, but um, uh, to, to, to call it ecocide for any ICL guy, you think, well, that must be something that could be no balancing. I mean, why would you ever have balancing in genocide? Of course, then you can say homicide also has side. So therefore, there is a, also a necessity in self-defense. That would be the counter, counter argument. Okay, so balancing is problem. And, and then to the mental element, I think here my issue is of course, you can absolutely legitimately deviate from Article 30, Charles. I absolutely agree with you. And that point is well taken. But you just have on page here, I have the proposal in front of me. You have on page, well, you have no page numbers, but in the PDF is page 11. You have not even half a page where you say what you want with it, Article 30. And then you say something which is which is uh, uh, absolutely contradictory. You say the panel proposal mens rea of recklessness or dullness of requiring awareness 
That's not recklessness. And that's not under no definition dolus eventualis, not even under the Scandinavian definition. And this point has been made. So that's technically incorrect. That doesn't mean that you cannot have your own standard, develop your standard you like, and you think you can convince states and that that's all legitimate. But please, uh, you should have been a bit more cautious with the technical uh, issue using words like dolus eventualis. Imagine this, all European lawyers the French, the Spanish, the Italians, <laughs> the Germans will jump on you. You use Dolus Eventualis. We struggle with this concept for hundreds of years, siglos, siglos, you know, centuries. <laughs> and also recklessness is a highly complex con com uh, concept. So that's just my technical point, but I'm open to any mental uh, uh, element solution. That's open for discussion. Thanks. So Kai, I have one follow-up question for you, and then I would like to hear what Charles and Kate have to say about the, the, the mental element issue. One follow-up question for you is, if this was not called ecocide, right? Let's just say it was called something else completely, right? The crime against environments. Would you have any issues then with the balancing that's attempted in, in frame, or the, the framing, framed balancing within the, 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 the proposed definition from the standpoint of, um, obviously the principle of legality or other principles under international criminal law. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole issue of the term, as you know, has been taken up by many and all have criticized it. It was, it was not a smart move to use this term. I mean, you provoke criticism, but of course that's not substantial. I mean, the issue is what is the actus reus and the mens rea, so the definition. I would have Christian Tomoshat, you know, uh, the one of the predecessors of Charles and the International Law Commission, when they worked the ILC on environmental crimes, I met him in Geneva once, and he was one of the most important people in the ILC to, to push this, you know, and he used the word crimes against the environment. Why, why, why do we use this kind of words? I mean, you, you never convince Germans, French, and most of us are much less, you know, trying to sell things, you know, not this Mac, McDonald's thing of, or Apple thing of using terms like agrocide. I mean, this is just, uh, uh, tr triggering certain criticism that is unnecessary because then people talk about the term all the time instead of looking at the definition. So I, that's why I didn't bring it up, Neymar. You know, not not to. I don't want to talk about all the time about this term. But as a German, I have to say something about it, since we are responsible for the most, unfortunately, for the genocide in in of the Holocaust. And so for Germans, it's even worse. We cannot just be silent if someone uses the word ecocide and that because that brings this parallel. And you even quote Raphael Lemkin, you know, so you, you couldn't have left it using ecocide. So that's just unnecessary. I take that point. But let's again take the branding aside. If we take the branding aside for a moment, would there be any issue with regards to the to the to the balancing that they have articulated from a, from a criminal law standpoint? Again, taking the branding, taking the term ecocide. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I take, it's, it's a very fair point. I think that's a separate point. And as I see it, you can have a balancing element as you have it in, as by way of military necessity in the war crime, which is the base of this proposal. And that's our big issue, but that will make a big, big prosecutorial issue because, because that would mean that the prosecutor has to take into account this balancing. So that, that's, and that was, I think that was a point Kevin Heller made very convincing in, in these three posts. And so, so it would certainly, Daryl's point also, simpler, simpler, easier to have a non-balancing as an element. Maybe it's more correct to have balancing because we know that there are social economic benefits linked to environmental damage. But that will bring many, many practical problems in terms of prosecuting this. And then this brings us back to deterrence. The worst thing you can do in criminal law is create crimes which nobody can prosecute. In my country, we have a serious system. Our pol politicians make all the time the argument of deterrence. And they, we have an expansion in the last 30 years of our criminal code, especially in the environmental part, but also in other things, hate crimes, what, what you name it. And, 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 and the prosecutors tell me we cannot prosecute this. First of all, we have not enough prosecutors. We cannot, we don't find the evidence. And in the end, the criminals are lucky and they say, well, you have this all in the code. That's poor symbolism to quote Charles. Yeah, that's symbolic criminal law. They're just in the code, but nobody applies it and the criminals will not be caught. So we're gonna to get to the practical questions in a second. I, I actually would be keen on hearing Charles and Kate's thoughts on the mens rea a bit. And then I think we'll pivot to the more practical questions that have also been arisen in the, in the Q and A from the audience.
So thank you uh, so much, uh, Nima, and thanks again to uh, Kai for the engagement. Uh, just some quick responses um, concerning uh, the issue of recklessness. Uh, one is, uh, if you look at, again, I know that when you rely on national systems and you're talking about international criminal law, you always run the risk that you might be offering too particular a view. So whether it's a, an understanding of recklessness drawn from the continental civil law tradition or a common law US-based uh, tradition. Uh, if you look at the US one with those caveats set aside and think about the model penal code, it says that recklessness uh, is, a, is, is distinct from purposely or knowing. Uh, it resembles um, awareness. It, it is a, the state of awareness is involved but the awareness is of the risk that is of a probability less than substantial certainty from the actor's point of view. So it's possible that you could interpret this particular language to actually fall within at least that particular understanding of what recklessness is. Now, my caveat is that this is obviously, <laughs> the US is not even a party to the Rome statute. So one could argue that the examples drawn from the US may not be relevant, but definitely the model pinnacle, which Kai himself cited earlier, does stand as one of the very important instruments that try to bring essentially a morass of mens rea in common law systems, at least for the United States and order them into four categories and say, this is how we should separate them out and understand the, 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 them and apply. And of course, it's been the most influential part of the model penal code, at least in the United States, but also sometimes internationally. Second point is to note that the issue of nomenclature of the crime, there were differences of view. What you see is an outcome of the process. Um, I ask constantly whether we should be calling this ecocide. I asked that question within the context of the expert group. I see that it could generate uh, some pushback and I see it's generated some pushback, but that was my own uh, minority view. Uh, the ILC, you mentioned Tom, uh, Christian Tomoshat. I uh, looked at the proposal by Christian that uh, was very, very influential in the ILC in the early days. And when you look at the ILC, uh, ultimately adopted definition is willful and severe damage to the environment. That was Article 26 of the ILC draft, willful and severe damage to the environment. But I think that issue could be addressed by saying, well, if we prefer, if they think about think about it from the point of view of states to have a different definition, then you could go about doing that. A final point is about the extent of the commentaries. Um, there are, of course, and this would not be perhaps a satisfactory defense, but there is uh, there are limitations to an ad hoc expert process that is about six months and working hard to come up with something. Um, I personally had a preference for a longer a commentary that gave longer explanations. But again, we're trying to find consensus because we wanted to send a message. If 12 international lawyers or criminal lawyers and environmental lawyers can come from around the world and agree on the content of something, that is a good working basis than if we were divided and split up because it's very, very easy to see the difficulty at the next level. So I'll end on that note, just to say that differences of view did exist in the committee, but it's not for me to now come to the table if we will and air all of those differences of view. What you have is a compromised text, and that's important, I think, to take into account. Thank you so much. I, I wanna to go to the last uh, set of questions that I have, and because and, they touch upon things that have been raised in some of the Q&A as well. And these are more, frankly, practical questions. And, and Yelena, I'm curious what you think about this, which is, uh, can we genuinely expect an overburdened and overextended ICC, which is already grappling, by the way, with the crime of aggression, but also with the massive situations that it has, um, to prosecute a, a crime of ecocide if it is adopted. And if, if we know it's not realistically in the cards that there will be an investigation anytime soon or in the next 10 years, why push it? What's the value uh, of having it on the books, so to say? Well, um, thank you. Uh, this is an extremely interesting discussion. I've been just so focused on the back and forth between the arguments. I feel like I'm a, an external now observer, not actually the panelist. Um, can, can it be done? I think uh, the one thing that we have to recognize is that the definition is a starting point, not the final point. And so, of course, all, including the technical details will be discussed throughout the years. And I, I absolutely hear Kate and I agree with her. I think eventually the, the definition in one form or another is going to be adopted. There will be, there has to be a new crime, I think. Um, during that process of discussing and, uh, and, and, and negotiating, 
there will also be the issue that states will consider, and it's always something that states consider when they negotiate during the treaty process or amendments, stuff, the, the, the logistical aspects, and of course, how much do I have to pay for it? How much do I have to put on a table? So if the new uh, amendment is adopted uh, and the new crime is introduced uh, as ecocide, there will perhaps potentially be also the, the extension of the budget, potentially the, the logistical means and stuff. As it is right now, uh, um, I mean, we all know how, how International Criminal Court is facing lots of challenges uh, and criticism, including the, um, the, 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 the global north, global south uh, division within uh, the strategies. And maybe Ecoside could be actually one of uh, those um, positive aspects that would bring to the uh, to, to deter those criticism. Um, but I think the, the challenges will still remain the same uh, in terms of investigating capacities and stuff, unless the states decide to, to extend their um, uh, contributions at the same time while they extend the, yeah, the, the, the statue of Rome to the echo site, um, I believe. Um, I'll, I'll maybe stop here. Yeah, Charles and Kai, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Charles, you sat on the Independent Expert Committee as it pertains to the selection of our prosecutors. You have a, a view in terms of how the OTP is structured, how it works. I'm curious whether you think that, that we can expect an OTP without some significant restructuring to undertake and prosecute these crimes, um, given your insights. And, and obviously, Kai, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as well. Thank you so much. I follow, I think, nicely on Elena. I, uh, the wider context for the ICC remains, and I am not convinced that even if states could find the agreement, given some of the divides uh, that Elena alluded to, the North-South divide. I mean, I think that I just saw one of the comments uh, from someone else asking whether this could be a way to uh, if you will, if you uh, to lower the temperature on the Africa ICC relationship, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. But my impression is that states are asking the ICC to do more with less. And there's a statement by the ICC prosecutor, the, Madame Bensuda, when she was leaving. The biggest challenge that she faced, she said, as a prosecutor, says she doesn't have the budget for all the stuff that she's been asked to do. So the OTP is asked to go situation after situation, even in respect to Security Council referrals, where the statute is very clear that the Security Council would not make a referral without asking the member states of the UN to carry the financial cost of that. We have developed a practice where essentially the ICC is acquiesced into basically give, been given more work. So I'm very, very doubtful there will be more resources. What, do, what does that mean then for the crime of ecocide? I see very little possibility that you then have the cash infusion to say, go on, deal with this environmental issue. Of course, it's always possible because political uh, will is critical in budgetary matters. But I do want to underline that the court is facing pushback on all the other levels that could even affect the possibilities of focusing specifically on environmental matters. Having said that, I take Helena's point. I do not think that it's realistic at this point to have an international uh, court for the environment. I don't think there's political appetite for that among states. Uh, you would get a lot of pushback in terms of what it means to set up new institutions from the ground up. And we very much thought that with the ICC around, that would be where we would develop our international efforts. And again, it took us over 50 years to get there. So I would be strongly in favor of not reinventing the wheel and trying to figure out how to use an existing institution. But I'm very, very doubtful that the, the, the support will be there. So it would be with all the caveats, maybe one big advantage could be the signaling effect, that symbolism that we're talking about, if you translate into implementation at the national level, because ultimately even the ICC itself, it, pre it presumes that the national courts will take the first burden. What we're seeing is the national systems subcontracting to the ICC what they should be doing at home. And so you have an overloaded docket, an overwhelmed court, and then you turn around, you don't give the cooperation, they say, aha, I see you're not doing a good job. Thank you very much. Kai, I know you have some thoughts on this and I'm, I'm curious to hear them. Yeah, if, if I may, just, just one, one pre previous point as to the model penal code and recklessness. I don't want to be pedantic on this, but the model penal code is the most important um, um, scholarly source for American criminal law because it tried to, to organize a very fragmented American criminal law. So it's a very valuable source and I would agree with Charles' um, uh, uh, interpretation of section 
who want defending recklessness that it could it could uh, we could read into it awareness so that that's it but that's just one definition of recklessness the american one and the english one is very different the canadian one the australian one and we and here I have to correct you, my dear friend, we do not have recklessness. And on the continent, we have dolus eventualis. That's exactly the point. <laughs> and that's why um, uh, we, we, were, we were a bit um, uh, sensible on this, on this issue. As to the ICC, and I largely agree with, with Jelena and with Charles, um, but I just want to make an additional point. I think we have to be very, very careful to make these kind of proposals because within the state parties, even within the state parties, not, are, not all are like-minded. You should never forget this. We have many opposition within the ICC and uh, uh, there have been other proposals out there. For example, certain states wanted to have truck trafficking as an ICC crime long after Kampala. And they are not always uh, uh, good face proposals. We have to be very realistic here. There are states who want to undermine the ICC and not just the African states and not just the states which are not in the system like Russia and China, you know, or, or Israel for that matter or India, you know. And so uh, what we don't want, I think, and here we would agree on this point, nobody wants to weaken the ICC more, I think. I think we would agree on this. And so we have to think twice or three times before we put something more on the plate of the ICC. And I wonder, Charles and Kat, Kate, did you actually speak to people working at the ICC, at the OTP, for example, informally? Because you say in your proposal you had a large kind of uh, consultancy going on. Nobody actually knows who you consulted with, but perhaps it would have been nice to speak to some prosecutors even people outside the ICC who have worked like Neymar, you know, <laughs> so they could have told you maybe, well, that would not go down well, this proposal, because they are the most competent people, the investigator, the prosecutor at the OTP to tell you if this makes sense. Did you actually talk to these people? So I think uh, I think that's a question, Kate, for, for you and Charles. Oh. And then following <laughs> that, I'm just mindful of the time. Uh, I'd like to hear some kind of closing thoughts on the subject, but, but can, I'll let you respond first. Sure, yeah, thank you, Kai. Well, I mean, of course we did have, I mean, Alex Whiting was on the panel, so he's currently involved in prosecuting an international court. And yes, we certainly did speak to uh, Nima, actually provided some very useful input uh, to the panel through the Promise Institute Working Group. Um, the, the, I mean, I hope it doesn't appear opaque, the scope of the consultations. I mean, we, we had a public consultation and that's all available on the website. Um, and then we had some other, you know, bilateral conversations, um, which were a bit more ad hoc. And, and frankly, I'm not sure exactly what they all were because individual members of the panel were free to consult with whoever they wished and then bring whatever was relevant into our, our conversations. But it's certainly not the idea to obfuscate any, uh, any consultations that the, that the panel had. Um, so maybe in closing then, Nima, I just, uh, well, first of all, I really appreciate this conversation. Thank you so much for hosting it. It's been very useful. I continue to think about this issue, of course, with this is just a first step putting out this definition and, and all of these reflections are very useful. I did want to make a comment about the term ecocide. So I think, um, I mean, I understand a, um, that it strikes some, and maybe you're among those, Kai, as a bit um, of a slogan, you know, or a bit too, like you talked about McDonald's or something. And I, I did slightly have that feeling myself at first, but I've changed my mind because I've seen the power of that word. I mean, if I say to anybody, I used to say, so the name of our working group at the Promise Institute was a working group on international law and protection of the environment for exactly those reasons. And of course, because it was broader as well than a new crime. But when I explain to people what I'm working on, you know, if they who are not in that sector, I can see their eyes glaze over. Now, if I tell people I'm working on ecocide, anybody that I speak to, they instantly get it. And people say to me like, wow, ecocide, you know, well, that's a no brainer. Or, I mean, it really, really resonates. And I think we have to accept that if we actually want to change international law, we have to have a conversation beyond you know, even the reaches of the American Society of International Law, of course, would be our first audience. But this has to be a general conversation. And a word like ecocide resonates with people. They understand instinctively what it means. And I think that's really valuable. And I think what I hear you saying is that 
because it sounds like genocide, there couldn't be any balancing, that that's one of your objections to the term. And, and I, I think with respect, that is a misunderstanding about our relationship to the environment and what we're trying to prevent. We are destroying the environment you know, every day in a way that is more or less problematic. Our goal is sustainable development. And what we are trying to outlaw is going completely out of balance for this relationship to be completely out of balance. So it's intrinsic that this, to destroy our environment, all that needs to happen is for us to go out of balance. If we look at environmental law, uh, the release of toxins, release of carbon, it's all permitted to a certain level. It's just becomes you know, prohibited or damaging at, at a particular level. If we look at genocide, I mean, killing people is, is prohibited, you know, apart from under very, um, very specific circumstances. So the two things can't be compared. Our relationship with the environment is about balance and going massively out of balance is what we are trying to prevent and what will eventually kill our environment, and make it impossible for human life and dignity to continue. And that is what we're trying to capture in the notion of ecosystem. Yelena, uh, Charles, and Kai, I wonder if you guys have any other closing thoughts, either on this subject that, that, that Kate just referenced and, and that Kai just ended on as well, or on other subjects that we've discussed. I'll maybe start. Um, yes, I think, thank you. Uh, we need to recognize the importance of this work and this definition. And as I said, it's the starting point, certainly not the final point. So I'm very much looking forward to see how it's going to evolve. And we certainly need to respect the efforts and the work invested by all the experts uh, in, this, in this definition. I strongly believe that we need this crime. And I strongly believe that needs, this crime needs to be integrated in one form of another uh, or another into the Rome Statute and International Criminal Court should be the competent jurisdiction that I strongly believe. Having said that, I have a regret, and I think this is not a secret, that there was a limitation from the start to this ecocide crime, to the definition that currently exists, by excluding the corporate actors. And I think it comes back to what exactly are we trying to achieve with the ecocide? And I think we all agree that we want to prevent the further uh, damage to environment to address the issue of climate change, which are very relevant, we are timely, we don't have the time to address those. And I think that the, the, what Kate just mentioned, the relationship between the environment and the people, and especially the people in the global south is extremely important. And adding corporate crimes to the, to the crime is extremely important message and the encouragement for those people in their fights against big corporations. Just to finish on that aspect, I do not think for a second, and it's very important where the definition is coming from. It does not at this stage come from the state. It comes from independent expert. And thus I do not believe for a second that we should deprive ourselves of the power and expertise and the belief that we have to prevent ourselves at the start to exclude corporate actors or to have a limited uh, definition. That is the role of the states. States, if the, the proposal comes to the table, will pick and choose what they want. But if we, at the start, as an expert, as an independent expert, deprive ourselves from that limit, then the states will never choose corporate responsibility or any other parts. So we need to push for more and maybe we'll get more. Thank you. Thank you, Yelena. Charles and Kai, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, Elena and of course, Kate uh, for very, very important uh, observations. I think Kate has answered uh, Kai's question. And I think uh, on the Promise Institute uh, website, uh, there is the document that compiles the responses of 402 individuals uh, participated in the survey. Uh, it was very interesting to me that the uh, responses were requested in English, but we also had English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese submissions, and many were from lawyers, but also many were from non-lawyers, which goes directly to the point about the relevance of this issue for everyone, essentially, and it shows the amount of interest that's out there. So that's just to highlight that there was an effort, both formally, but also informally, to reach out to a broader network of individuals who have expertise on the subject to assist. Um, the second uh, point by way of closing observations really to just underline uh, my own view, which is really, uh, it's quite uh, uh, impressive to hear Elena's point and plea uh, concerning uh, corporate liability. I have always been of the view that this is one of the blind spots of international criminal law. 
I have been outraged as a scholar from Sierra Leone. Uh, when you think about the Sierra Leone conflict and the individuals who have been tagged with liability for what happened in Sierra Leone, the people who are the beneficiaries, I've written about this for many years, the real beneficiaries of the Sierra Leone conflict. It's just one example of one of these horrific conflicts of our lifetime, uh, diamond dealers who would never be reached by international criminal law. So my view is that the next turn for international criminal law is corporate criminal responsibility in relation to those acts. And I take the point very well that experts shouldn't limit themselves. It may be the business of states to limit themselves, but I also want to bring in the hopeful point that sometimes states can agree, even if it's just a region, at least when the conditions are there, we will see the Malabo protocol come into force and it does include corporate criminal liability. It may be that the process of developing these norms would have that feedback that we see where you have national, regional and international development sometimes complementing each other and creating the conditions uh, for that to happen. Uh, just a final word of uh, gratitude. I think this is a great conversation. Um, to uh, this, I see it as the beginning of a conversation and I'll be uh, very keen to continue the conversation in other forms. And for all the scholars who have views and ways we could improve the definition long before it gets to states, let's all jump in. The great feedback that we've seen and the engagement we've seen was very promising. And I hopefully would make that this experience this time a little bit different from all the prior efforts so that we get that conversation to the states and let them uh, do what they must. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. And Kai, I leave it to you to, to to end the discussion with your final thoughts. Yeah, yeah thanks Thanks a lot also to, to all of you for this very important conversation. I think um, perhaps one should not so much focus on the ICC and that was a bit uh, where the project got a lot of resistance. I think if we took up all these different avenues, how to better protect our environment, where collective responsibility, corporate responsibility is a very important issue. And, and, and we, we talk today of international economic criminal law. I mean, uh, there are, uh, uh, here can follow up on Charles, there are many people working on this. We have the uh, commission uh, in the Human Rights Council, which works on this, uh, on this convention, you know, on, on uh, corporate responsibility for serious human rights violations. We have the whole compliance movement. We have, of course, federal prosecution by United States, think of Dieselgate um, as an example, very efficient American prosecution compared to the German one, for example, or the European one. And these are all different, let's say, different ways uh, we can also use in um, environmental law. And why not open up the debate instead of being so focused or, or narrowed down on the ICC Avenue? Why not think of how could we have a better environmental if you want criminal law on the international level. I take the point that the national law has a problem. In some states, it's very well implemented, I would say in Germany, but in others, uh, there, there's corruption. There are many, many issues. And um, so the national avenue is not always a successful avenue, especially if you look at states which are weak in, uh, in the face of multinational corporations. So, so there is no way uh, to, to, to enforce this national criminal law against multinational cooperation, therefore we need international law. And here, but I think we have to open up this debate. I think we should maybe a bit uh, get away from the ICC focus. That's where I'm really convinced. I, don't, I, I think we, we, we do a disservice to the ICC when, when, we, when we bring this in and when uh, it, will not be, it will not be approved anyway, but, but I wouldn't even do it. And I would just uh, relaunch this again and, and maybe say, well, let's have a general debate on how can we have a more efficient international criminal law to protect the environment, but with a more open-ended, the forum question is a secondary question, you know, so that would be my final kind of plea. And um, next week there will be another um, uh, uh, ACIL hosted panel with Philip Sands, by the way, I just wanted to let you know, and a colleague from Cambridge, we just sent it around via our manager, uh, Neymar, from ASIL to the crew. So um, debate is going on. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for organizing this. Thank you, everyone. I think the conversation was a robust one. We had deliberately intended to bring people together with divergent and encouraging views in order to give, give, give attention to this important matter. Uh, thank you for all engaging and thank you for all the participants, many of whom stuck through the entire hour and a half over now. Uh, conversation. I think it's fruitful. And I think this is the part, uh, this is the start of the conversation and it's certainly not going to end here.
Thank you again.